Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today. Um, today we have the unique privilege of having the DGs of the MBC and FCSN and key players in the industry. Um, they will be introduced subsequently by the moderators. I have the short task of setting the tone of our webinar in this opening remark. My name is Sumbo Akintola. I am a partner in the practice and the practice head of the telecommunication, media, entertainment, and technology department in Alupo and Oyebode. The webinar is a collaborative effort between the TMET practice and the sports practice headed by Mark Modi. Uh, he would also be joining us at some point during the course of the webinar. Um, the interdependency of the regulator and the regulated entities actually requires a lot of uh, collaboration and engagement that fosters growth in the sector. And with the intention that we have a win-win situation between the regulators and regulated entities to some extent. So this webinar primarily is a discourse um, with the ultimate aim of achieving certain goals, uh, analyzing the MBC code, giving um, information as much as possible from both sides of the divide, uh, creating an understanding uh, with the objective of actually creating a, a robust sector and a very successful sector. I'm not going to take too much of your time because I want us to deep dive into this. And I will now hand over to our moderators, Ina Arome, a senior associate in the TMET department, and Ayokunle Faith Adetula, a senior associate in the sports and IP practice. Over to you guys. Thank you, Mrs. Akitola, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Before I proceed to provide a profile of our panelists, I would like to inform our participants that this webinar is being recorded. Very quickly, we will be running a poll and we humbly ask all our participants to take the survey within the next 30 seconds to one minute as we proceed. Some housekeeping rules. Participants will be muted during this webinar so that we can hear ourselves. And along the line, please provide your questions in the Q&A box. We would appreciate if you provide concise questions and possibly you may like to indicate who the question among our panelists is directed to. We will take questions from our panelists in the course of a webinar and as time will permit us. So this afternoon we have five panelists as you will probably see from your screen and we'd like to thank every one of them for making time out of their busy schedules to be with us this afternoon. Our first panelist is Professor Idachaba. Professor Armstrong Idachaba is the Acting Director General of the National Broadcast Commission. Next on our list is Mr. Jason Njoku. Mr. Jason Njoku is unarguably one of Africa's well-known entrepreneurs. He's the founder of Iroko TV, and one of the largest African paid services provider. Also, we have Mr. Namdi Obanya with us. Mr. Namdi is a sports broadcaster and a media enterprise consultant with almost two decades, uh, uh, two decades of experience uh, in the industry. We also have uh, Mr. Baba Agba with us, who is the National Secretary of the Association of Movie Producers in Nigeria. He has over 10 years experience working in the Nigerian creative industry. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Mayowa Ayilana, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the 
Music Copyright Society of Nigeria, MCSN. MCSN is a collective management organization and the single largest owner assigning an exclusive licensee of copyright in musical works, sound recordings, and ancillary rights in Nigeria. Now I would like to hand you over to my colleague, Ina Arume, who is a senior associate uh, with the telecoms, media, entertainment, and technology practice of the firm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayokune, for the introduction. So we'll go into the discourse now. Professor Ida Chaba, the introduction of the amendment has been met with a lot of pushback from stakeholders with several articles appearing in print media. Sir, as a DG, you have the unique privilege to give us some context on the rationale for these amendments and perhaps also give us some response on why there's a disconnect between the NBC and stakeholders. Also, what has been the mode of stakeholder engagement on past amendments to the previous editions of the code? Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. The DG will join you shortly. Just give him um, 20 minutes, please. Thank you, sir. Okay, so good. Um, okay, so J um, thank you. Jason, um, the introduction of the amendment has been met with a lot of pushback from stakeholders with several articles appearing in print media. Do you think there's a disconnect between NBC and stakeholders? And can you please give your reasons? Was that aimed at me? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Um, where do you want to start? So I would have preferred to go after um, Professor Mungus, because uh, again, I'd love to hear his thoughts. So I kind of feel a bit um, obviously surprised that he's been unable to join us, bearing in mind I know how much you guys have followed up on on making sure that people get here in time. So if you want, if you want to get a, a sense of the, um, the energy of the engagement of uh, NBC to stakeholders, this is a perfect example of that. I think first and foremost, there have been no real engagement, to be frank. Um, again, for the life of me, um, you know, Professor was, uh, you know, he's an acting DG. He started on the 21st of February. Today is the 7th of September. I, I, I strongly, I'm strongly surprised that he was able to actually, you know, create this amendment, have it draft, have it reviewed and have it released to publications all in three months. If that is genuinely the case, I'm astonished and surprised at the speed of the NBC has been working, at least over the last 10 years that I've been uh, uh, sort of part of the industry. Um, again, I, I would have loved to ask his question specifically to the to, to professor, but first and foremost, like, you know, which, which industry stakeholders did he actually engage? Because he definitely didn't engage me, definitely didn't engage anybody else that I've spoken to. And I've spoken to Multichest, I've spoken to Netflix, I've spoken to folks at Silver, I've, I've spoken to Star Times, I've spoken to uh, Film House. These people largely make up the industry. And from my perspective, like, you know, no one was really engaged. But again, I would love for him to um, shed some light um, on, on that. You know, I've held licenses in other countries. Um, you know, I've I held an Ofcom license in the UK for four years as I broadcast a channel there in Morocco. So I, I got a sense of what it takes to obviously be, uh, you know, a world class, um, you know, licensee to adhere to all of the very rigorous standards of, a, of sort of the UK, which I think is a gold standard in terms of broadcasting, in terms of competition. And by the sounds of things, it's where, you know, the NBC heavily, um, relied on for their kind of their, their drafting. Um, I think I think it's great, you know, Luca, you know, I think I love, you know, you guys are fantastic lawyers. I would love to understand which team actually drafted the words which went into that agreement, because they're terrible. Like, they should get fired, as far as I'm concerned. So for me, it's like, who drafted them at NBC? Who, which lawyers were pulled in to basically help them with the word? Because it created actually more problems in terms of, you know, classifications, in terms of definitions, than I think any other piece of, like, legal ease I've seen in a very, very long time. So again, like, I would have loved to ask this directly to Professor, but unfortunately, he decided not to join us, or he, maybe he's a more important business, and obviously, sort of, in stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, this is not the first time there's been a code introduced. Um, there's been 10 years that at least I've been in the industry. Um, there's been lots of conversations around what they want to do, how they want to make a, a level playing field. There are ways and means to do this. Um, unilaterally doing this, um, especially at this period of time where I think everybody can agree, the entire world is you know, 
balance on, on the precipice of like abyss in terms of economies and stimulus and all these other things. So I think, you know, Nollywood without any real stimulus, without any real support, is now basically being thrown a massive curveball. Again, I would have loved to talk to um, and ask directly a uh, professor of this, but unfortunately he's decided that, I guess, stakeholder engagement is less of importance to him. I think going on, I, I think, you know, I was deeply concerned uh, when it first came out. Yes, I had a very brief um, uh, expression of my concerns on Twitter. After that, you know, I sent letters to uh, the VP's office. I sent letters to um, uh, Professor in NBC. I sent letters to Chairman at the NBC. Do you know what? Today is the 7th of uh, September. I've, 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 I've got nothing back. No formal acknowledgement that I got your letter. No formal acknowledgement that we're working on the process. Instead, a few weeks ago, I personally attacked by the NBC DJ. I got a personal attack. Oh, sir, welcome, you're here. Welcome, uh, Professor Vince here, so I can speak directly to you. Um, I got a personal attack, which was 100% inaccurate. And I think I, I was genuinely surprised and shocked at the time. And again, I, I didn't say anything at the time, but I think it's fantastic that the DJ is here, at least to hear, hear this part. Um, I think first and foremost, you know, I, I hope that your team has now kind of given you the correct information about Iwako and some of the words, I would say inflammatory words that you, you directed to my, myself and my company. Um, I have a stellar reputation in Nigeria for the last 10 years. I've been involved in no public spats with anyone of note. I've just tried to run my business. I've never engaged uh, politicians or the industry at large other than just to kind of try to build the industry. So again, I was surprised by the personal nature of the attack. I was surprised at the personal nature of, um, of the comments towards me. Um, so again, like, you know, before I, I guess I, you know, respond myself, I would definitely give the opportunity for Professor to apologize to me uh, here now in person and then further gone, um, apologize and write in later on. You know, there's a lot of things that were said. Uh, again, I, I've always been willing to, uh, you know, robustly defend my company and my actions. Um, you know, I, I think there's no conversation of Nollywood and broadcasting in Nigeria over the last 10 years without the conversation of Rocco Thank being you, there. Jason. So with all due respect, Jason. I think when you talk to the industry, you, you have to talk to us as well. That's thank all. you, Jason. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, welcome, Mr. Um, Professor Idachaba. Um, we started the discussion as to why there's a disconnect between NBC and stakeholders. Um, because it's, the amendments have been met, was, was met with a lot of pushback, and we'd like to know why there's a disconnect between NBC and stakeholders, and also what has been the mode of stakeholder engagement in the past on amendments to the previous editions of the code. Anyway, um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. All right, good afternoon. It's good to be with you. Um, Again, we, we appreciate all those who make efforts to dialogue with the NBC. Incidentally, this is one of series of uh, webinars that we've held uh, in the week of uh, some of our activities. And I think it's uh, healthy that we engage in continuous dialogue. Uh, I walked in and heard uh, Mr. Jason uh, casting all sorts of aspersions and using some uh, generally uncouth words about me, my person, and my office. Uh, I, I wish to register first that that is not fair. Uh, I don't know what kind of modus you do when you shave somebody's head behind his back. Um, I speak to you directly, sir. I think I have the, the floor to talk. Uh, to answer your question directly, Ina, Ina Arome, uh, did I get it right? Yes, sir. In uh, Arome. Arome sounds very familiar. Uh, good to talk with you. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, seeming disconnect. I think that that is largely misplaced. And I want everybody listening to follow this conversation clearly. What I've tried to do in recent time is to go indulge in some form of um, educating regarding the process. Apparently, uh, there's a lot of ignorance that's been going on, and I think it's the responsibility of what is pushing the policy uh, to exhaust all the elements of um, enlightenment as much as the regulator can. Now, what is the issue about the Sixth Amendment to the Broadcasting Code, the amendment to the Sixth Edition? Uh, for you to do an amendment, it means there's an original document. The original document is the sixth edition of the Broadcasting Code. 
Now, the sixth edition of the Broadcasting Code was released in July 2019. And the last exercise building up to the release of that document in 2019 held in Kano. Now, preceding the Kano meeting, there were lots of stakeholder engagements that NBC has NBC will characteristically do over time. Right? We met in Kaduna, I remember once or twice, uh, before we went to Kano to validate the reports. And then after that, we came out with the sixth edition. Now, there's nowhere in the Broadcasting Act that actually provides that the regulator must invite stakeholders before you fashion a code. The Act clearly says that the NBC shall fashion, produce a broadcast code for the industry and disseminate same. What the NBC has done as a responsive broadcast regulator over the years is to do this to work towards inclusiveness, industry inclusiveness by inviting stakeholders who know to participate. I know of several regulatory agencies that don't organize stakeholder meetings. I don't know how many times road safety gets people together before they set new speed limits or ask people to put measures for safety in their vehicles. Those are regulatory interventions. But we have invited the industry over time, and we think it's mutually beneficial. We have enjoyed the engagements that we hold with the industry. It gives us a background for information and knowledge. But all said and done, the prerogative is still on the regulator you know, to come up with what it feels is in the best interest of the country and the industry. In this particular instance of the amendment, and I want everybody again to listen keenly, after the 2019, May 2019 elections, at the meeting of the Federal Executive Council, there was, a, there was, there was some kind of uh, resentment regarding the conduct of broadcast stations uh, during the elections. And what was the issue? Speaker after speaker observed that there was a lot of abusive words, very inciting comments during the election. And they wondered what the NBC did you know, to check the trend. They also wondered whether there was no enough provision in the act setting up the commission or the broadcasting code that um, the, to the extent that broadcasters, you know, were largely on, on restrained on, on doing that, you know, in the use, in allowing the use of uh, highly inciting, hateful, and uh, discriminatory comments. And the people now said, the people now, the government now requested NBC, you know, requested the minister to set up an investigation. Part of the investigation, uh, the committee was set up, was led by Bayo Nanuga, MD of Busa that came up with various uh, suggestions, principally to look at the NBC Act, including the code, to look at the institution itself and see how it can be better positioned to perform its regulatory role. So it was from there that the purpose, the, 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 the need to re-examine the code came up. And we, there was a lot of, even at that level, there was a lot of stakeholder investment uh, 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 in, intervention. We invited lots of people across the board. Even the NBC board was represented in that committee. And if you give me time, I'll mention some of the stakeholders that participated. The broadcasting organizations of Nigeria participated actively. They were represented by their president or chairman, who was even the one that made the presentation on monopoly and exclusivity. Professor Tony Iregia was invited at that meeting and he gave evidence. Amitya and Akwe of Red Power came to meet the committee. He also made presentations. We wrote to virtually every, every stakeholder, you know, to make a presentation. And when we finished, we subjected those recommendations to a review session in Lagos. Even that was even at that session, uh, NUJ was present, Bond was present, uh, Professor Ralph Akinfele was present, Dala Dibako uh, was chairman of that event, he was representing the board of the NBC. So we had a white stakeholder engagement, even when it was supposed to be a mere amendment. Thank you, sir. We understand that um, there was white. Um, there was white stakeholder engagement, and although it is not within the act to um, 
have stakeholder engagement as part of the inclusiveness with for the industry you decided to have a stakeholder engagement thank you sir um NMD, do you think there's a disconnect between nbc and stakeholders flowing from what the dg has just said hi enam please could you unmute yes i was sorry yes definitely there, there is a disconnect there's a disconnect it's and it varies um per stakeholder Yes, he said some people were carried along, a lot of people were invited, but because of the amount of ambiguity that is still present in what is available, um, it means that there were still lots of people who were not involved. Um, once information is mediated and it's going from person to person, you will always get confusion. And that's why a lot of people probably don't feel carried along because of the information gap. There is an information gap. I've been on many sides of this table. I've worked for radio stations, I, um, with respect to sports broadcasters and as a general manager of radio station. So I understand when these things happen and when people don't feel carried along. Um, yes, it's an amendment. Yes, there was an act. It's not too dissimilar from what was there. But with each improvement, somebody is going to uh, feel something for want of a better term. There's going to be somebody who is at a disadvantage. I can clearly understand um, the DG's frustration with feeling that maybe we don't appreciate the fact that even though we don't need to be carried along, they still try to involve us. But the truth is that regardless of what the act says, if you're making laws to affect certain segments of society, those people need to have some say in it. Because government by definition is a social contract. And you cannot um, have a social contract without um, offer and acceptance from all sides of it. You know, so how is there any sort of contract in this? The NBC is basically giving us, if it's not saying that we should be carried along, then it's a decree. It's not an act for us to work with. And it's, it's, it's a bit unfair to the practitioners, if I'm to be very, very honest. I do appreciate the efforts of the NBC. I will not pretend that they do not very frequently send out a lot of communications. But the thing is, at these sessions, who is represented? If a few radio stations are represented, we have almost 40 radio stations that we listen to in Lagos State, just from that small, spe small spectrum. How many, you have urban stations, talk stations, sports stations, um, adult contemporary, who was represented? Everybody's affected in a different way. So it's this information gap and the fact that perhaps not everybody, not every segment has been properly addressed. That is probably the reason for this perception. I would call it more of a perception of a disconnect than an actual disconnect. Thank you, Inamdi. This is noted. So we understand that there is a yeah, representation yeah. in the there is no representation in the segment. Sorry, now let me just respond to Namdi quickly. Okay. You see, I appreciate, I appreciate the point about total inclusiveness. But I can tell you that I've been in NBC long enough to know that even when we publicize retreats and meetings like this, not everybody turns off. Even when we do trainings for industry, specialized trainings to improve skills. Not everybody turns off. The stakeholder engagement we had in Lagos was publicized in the newspapers, three national dailies, right? And there's no way, like Nambi rightly said, you can bring into a room 400 broadcast stations and their representatives. People get busy at certain times. Sometimes these things are coordinated at the levels of the unions. And that's why I told you that Bonn participated actively in all the sessions. NUJ was also involved. I don't see how the membership, the entire membership of the broadcast sector, no matter how well intentioned and how well publicized, will gather in the room. By the way, making a code is about interest. There's no way you can have a holistic aggregated interest that's anonymous. There must be one or two people they are going to feel slighted or feel underrepresented or feel unprotected. And that is why government in its wisdom gives the power to the regulator to decide on behalf of the industry. I'm sorry I had to interject. We can continue now. Thank you, sir. No, I, I, was done. I was done. I was done. Thank you. Okay, okay so um, I think we have uh, listened to the interplay between NBC and stakeholders. Uh, let's just look at some specifics of the code and uh, the interplay with even some other laws. 
in the country. Now, uh, I mean uh, the Nigerian Copyright Act. And I, I, I want to go to Mr. Yilara now. Uh, the Copyright Act confers exclusive rights in a broadcast to broadcasters. It also allowed broadcasters the right to the exploitation of such rights. List with these rights is also the right to license the broadcaster's rights on favorable contractual terms with any licensee. Now, from the readings of the amendments to the code, do you think the code impacts on this right? I mean the broadcaster's right now. And what are your views on the modification of the exclusive right that the Nigerian Copyright Act gives to broadcasters and probably the negotiation among parties to, to grant such rights to licenses? Um, sorry, can I take that? Uh, I, I think Mr. Ayilana, probably we can, can come to you. So Mr. Ayilana, please, let's have your thoughts. You can please unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adetula. Uh, good afternoon, uh, the professor, Professor Edachaba. Uh, <laughs> this is the second or third time we are meeting over this uh, uh, particular hey, issue. Hey, yes. God, and, I'm, and I'm glad to see you again. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good, good afternoon, afternoon to the uh, panelists, Jason, Enamdi, uh, Babagba. The symbol we have talked earlier on, and you know. um, uh, my own reaction to your question is: first, we need to understand the meaning of uh, uh, broadcast, because what is broadcast as meant or protected by the Copyright Act? This consists of the signal and the content as sent out or transmitted by the broker by a broadcaster so when you have that signal and the content made by a broadcaster then that broadcaster has an exclusive right to that particular broadcast because it constitutes what the copyright act uh, classify as an original work that is original broadcast. So the broadcaster is the author of that particular broadcast. So that broadcaster has exclusive rights. He can license to others and he can distribute to others. Or he can send signal by itself to the home or any other platform. But when you are now talking about another person taking that same broadcast, to want to take it exclusively for the same purpose that the original broadcasters had intended. I think what the MBC code is trying to do is to make the work easily available to more users, I mean users, than a person who may abuse a dominant position or who may abuse monopoly. I'll give you the example of what has happened over the years with regards to Premier League signals or Premier League brokers. From the beginning, if you see those of our broadcasters who are claiming rights to this, they didn't contribute anything to the, to the making of those signals and the broadcast content. They only went to the market, take it wholesale, then keep it under their sword and sell at whatever price they want. Even when local broadcasters wanted it, maybe I have uh, a transmitter in my village and I want to leverage on the rights that you already have to broker, I mean to have and distribute to my village people at a reasonable cost. The abuse of uh, a dominant position coming and the, the, the abuse of monopolistic tendency comes, whereby the person would not even allow me and then the next thing we see is that the man himself will go to that village trying to set up his own uh, something. I think this is what the NBC code is trying to uh, guide against or to rectify. But 
when you go further to look at both the Copyright Act and the Broadcasting Code, the question then arises that can that code oust or limit a right granted by the by an act of national assembly because exclusive exclusive uh, exclusivity rights is granted by the uh, copyright act but i don't know whether the national broadcasting commission act i have not really you know gone to study the commission act uh, holistically whether that act also legislates on exclusivity of rights with regards to their, uh, their control, their expectation, and so on and so forth. So on that note, I will, my own suggestion will be a, a deeper consideration of the Nigerian Copyright Act with regards to uh, exclusive rights of a, a broadcaster and the National Broadcasting Commission Act on that same subject. And once we are able to do that, we can come to an open ground. But I must commend the NBC for what they are doing. What I have seen personally in the broadcasting code is to engender national creativity. Because what we have is that we have people going abroad, taking all kinds of program signals and dumping it on Nigeria. But we, have, we are having a situation where by even when they do this, they dictate the price. The common man cannot even assess it. All these, I think, I think are behind the thinking of the MBC and even the bond. And just like the, 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 the uh, pro, uh, professor said, I hinted, our users, many of our broadcasters, recently we organized a webinar for broadcasters. Out of the people, many broadcasting stations that we invited, only a handful of them attended that webinar. And tomorrow they'll be shouting that MCSN is imposing tariff because they are not alive to their own uh, responsibility. They claim to be busy, but they are not looking at the legal aspect, the real monetary aspect of their business. So I, I will say my own, the way I see it, but that is the situation. We have that seminar. Many people were even followed up by phone calls but they didn't come. And it has been our experience over the years. When the government, organized, government agency will do anything, seminar or something, at the opening day and the opening session, you see quite a large number of people, but when you now go to the business session, only a few of them attend. I have attended broadcasting organization, uh, 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 General Assembly. Many of the broadcasters that are supposed to be there with their own association. They don't, they don't attend, not to talk of uh, 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 making contributions. But when the bond itself comes out with a decision, many of these broadcasters will go ahead to be challenging bond. Who gave them right? I am the owner of my broadcast station. Things cannot be done like this and we believe that, I mean, we, we, we expect to go forward. No. So we need to address ourselves we in the private sector, we need to talk the truth to ourselves. And we should not take government agency uh, as a bashing object every time we have these kind of things. So I will stop there because uh, concerning what I've uh, said, the only issue I have is that can that code oust the provisions of the Copyright Act? Otherwise, it's a good, it's a good uh, means of expanding the scope of exploitation. And when the scope of exploitation is expanded, then the room to make more money is there. Thank you. So it's, just like, it's just like what we have in the Copyright Act under compulsory licensing. The law says that you must make your work, once it is outside there, available to anybody who is interested at a reasonable cost. If you do not do that, the law will take a cause that it can be licensed compulsorily at a price that is a uh, fear to the to, to the habitat which is the regulatory authority and you can't do anything about it really so thank you very much thank you for your thoughts sir. we 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 quite appreciate that and uh, i think uh uh mr 
Agua wanted to quip in earlier. So I don't know if he wants to do just yeah. one or two thoughts and then. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for having me and being here. I think the broadcasting code and all these sort of um, back and forth and perceptions, perceived marginalization or non involvement, you know, we have all of that. But I want us to just drill down and get through it in asking, first of all. We know the code deals on so many different things, whether it's radio broadcast, television broadcast, et cetera. My first question would be, who are the stakeholders? Who does the NBC regulate, first of all? Then we now go into the different sections of the updated code and say, what does it actually say? Because, so are we saying categorically that there's an issue with every part of the code or that everybody for every part of the code was not involved or not? Or what, where exactly is the problem? Because you have one side dealing with sports, one side dealing with music, one side dealing with advertisers, on another side with local content, on another side um, looking at um, what's it called, television channels and pay TV platforms. So where exactly is the problem? Now, just to go off of what Mr. Anila said, yes, there's an exemption in the Copyright Act, uh, I think it's M, that says that once you put something out publicly, it can be compulsorily licensed. Now, it's not to say that the code necessarily says that, but we'll get to that. Um, I feel we should literally break it down and make this conversation a bit easier because I'm getting, I mean, Jason clearly has some issues with the code. The part of the code that I might say, oh, maybe there are some problems is the sports side, but I know Jason doesn't do sports. So I'm not sure which part of the code he has a problem with. And Namdi might have some points there on how that goes. I think that would just help everyone follow on and help us go through the document much better. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Baba. Uh, I think uh, Ina will be on now. Thank you, Ayokunle. Um, the next question is posed to all the panelists, but I'll start with Professor Idachaba. So the Nigerian economy is reeling from the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and global economic recession. There's further loss of jobs and there's destruction of investor confidence. Now, stakeholders are of the opinion that investor confidence would sink to an all-time low as a result of the code. Do you see the possibility of a decline in investment in the sector to the recent amendment? And have you, has the NBC put in place any soft landing plans for content providers and broadcasters? <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ina. And uh, let, me, let me pay special uh, regards to Ayelara for breaking down these issues in very clear and concrete terms. Uh, I, I, I love your elucidation. That takes a lot of the, the, the pressure of what I intended to say. Uh, Bababa, also thanks for, for your input. But you also raised a fundamental question. The, the, the question Bababa raised is, uh, who does the NBC regulate? Who is the NBC's client? And we need to understand that. NBC regulates the broadcaster. And our principal clients are our licensees. Those who have valid license from the NBC, they apply for a license. We check their background and we ensure that they are Nigerian businesses run majorly by Nigerian companies. And we give them license under terms and conditions. Now, some of the people who have made the most, most comments including the most veteranic, most, most acidic comments, very dangerous, inciting comments, like uh, Jason's company, are not clients to the NBC. I've sent his papers. He was talking earlier before I came that he wrote a letter. How long did it take him to write that letter? Almost two, three months after he started that, uh, that relentless attack on the regulator. Companies like DSTV that are licensed by NBC, at the inception of the whole issue, wrote a modest letter to the regulator. They engaged us. We wrote back to them to explain, reassuring them that their businesses are going to be protected. We checked out the, the, the status of Biroko TV. It is not a licensee of NBC. Yet, it is the one that is hitting up the quality the most. It is the one that is making all the claims the most. So why, where is the locus? So uh, the, uh, 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 and, to, uh, and to address the issue that um, Mr. Ilara raised again, clearly 
The NBC does not in any way want to conflict with regulations that already exist. If anything, the NBC Act actually, the code actually prescribes that we expect broadcasters to apply to, ab to abide by all relevant laws you know, that relate to the broadcast industry, including the Copyright Act. And I don't see where the, the, the conflict is. Nobody is saying you cannot acquire your rights. By the way, most broadcasters actually deal with rights that are owned by other people. How many of them actually produce their own content? How many of them actually own content? The big TV players are just uh, more or less like distribution patterns, uh, platforms for contents that they acquire. So we are saying those who own this content, we put them on notice. If you are dealing to a broadcaster in Nigeria, understand that this broadcaster will be obliged to make it available because we want our own local industry to grow. We are saying our broadcasters cannot acquire content from any source and warehouse and use their broadcast channel to enrich other organizations that are not contributing even minimally to the national economy. We are saying content acquired for the Nigerian territory must be made available to the general educational entertainment good of the ordinary Nigerian. I give you an example. Every Saturday, even with the EPL, where windows are created for terrestrial television, you know how much economic activity that generates for the little, little players that are in the villages that put their curtains behind the walls and charge people to come and watch? Or even local advertising that goes to the local terrestrial stations when those little windows are created? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. This is noted. Um, I'll just go back to Jason. Jason, please, I would like you to um, respond. Um, Baba said that the code doesn't affect, he wants to know how the code affects your industry. Could you please um, give us insights to how this affects your industry? And also let us know what the, whether there's a possibility of a decline in investment in the sector due to the recent amendments. Yeah, no, so first and foremost, I think um, there's been some really interesting uh, conversations here, right? Um, I think first and foremost, like, you know, the facts are that over the last five years, Iwako has easily been one of the largest investors in Nigerian content in existence, right? So we've spent in excess of $25 million. That has gone directly to Nigerian production houses, Nigerians, again, in Lagos, Enugu, Asaba, Obuja. It's gone throughout the entire ecosystem, right? Um, now, granted, we are not a client of the NBC, but ultimately, we are um, ultimately, uh, I guess, one of the largest people who are ultimately going to be impacted by this, right? So again, um, I'm a Nigerian. I've got a Nigerian passport. So I like to think that I'm as Nigerian as everybody else here, um, first and foremost. I think secondly that, um, so when I, when I commission or I produce a piece of content, um, that piece of content is Nigerian content. It's Nollywood content. That piece of content arguably is some of the most popular content in, in, in Nigeria. Um, does that fall within the, 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 the new amendment? From the first reading, it does. Now again, it then becomes a question of, well, well if I can't um, at least exclusively try to um, exploit this content over a period of time, um, and if it's available for everybody, then, then why, would I, why would I invest the tens of millions of dollars I do over a period of time to do that? And I think the key thing is that, you know, that there are 700 broadcast stations. I think they will individually participate in this industry. I think that's fantastic. But I would love to see how much they're spending and investing in the industry, and if not, why? So I, I think the key thing is that, um, from, from my perspective, it's what is the point of investing if ultimately I will be compelled to share that content with everybody? And if, again, what a commercially sensible price may be to me and to the people who have obviously commissioned and paid for that content, um, may not be this, but may, may not equally be um, uh, affordable, I would say, to the large number of participants who are currently in the market. Um, so, I think from my perspective, it, you know, we talk about, again, we talk about stakeholder in, in engagement. Um, you know, the biggest people who were impacted by this were ultimately the producers of 
again, sports is one thing. I'm not talking about sports. Um, that's somebody else's sort of battle to fight. But in terms of, you know, the Netflixes in the world, I'm, I'm pretty confident they weren't, um, they weren't engaged. You know, myself wasn't engaged. Um, African Magic, I'm pretty confident, were not fully engaged. Um, there are a whole bunch of other people. Film House weren't fully engaged. So just for people who actually produced Nigerian content, as who are Nigerians, who are incorporated in Nigeria, who are obviously trying to, off their own sort of personal backs and from investors, build an industry here. Um, it's created a huge amount of a lack of clarity in what the actual um, future of, you know, their protections and their ability to produce content in the first place. And let me be frank, like, it, you know, my investor is kind of police in French speaking Africa, right? They understand and they know what the, what the game is like, right? My other investor was, was, a, was the lead investor in Gokada. So they can see what, when regulatory wins change, what happens to businesses in Nigeria. So you can imagine like, you know, their, their appetite to increasingly invest in Nigeria has definitely dimmed over the last few months since this uh, lack of clarity came to be. So again, I can only fight my own fight. My fight is purely on Again, I'm producing Nigerian content. That content is incre in increasingly popular in Nigeria. Um, the, the definitions um, and the amendments um, and the engagement, at least with people who create content, I, I just don't see was there. Uh, I could be completely wrong. Um, and again, just, just to sort of go back to um, sort of Professor, I'm not a client, but then when the NBC specifically targets um, me and my company, I'm due a response, right? So if someone says a few weeks ago that Iwoko is based somewhere else, Iwoko is casting off huge amounts of money, which again, just to be frank, is couldn't be further from the truth. And I think, you know, 10, 15 minutes of investigation of Iwoko TV in Nigeria or Iwoko TV in the UK, you will see there are tens of millions of dollars of like net operating losses over the last 10 years as we try to build the business. So when you specifically say things which I know, and anyone who was to go and research know are categorically incorrect, my expectation would be that perhaps someone clarify that, perhaps it's an apology, perhaps that's followed up by a written letter saying, hey, you know what, Jason, we made a mistake here. You know that client, some of the things we said were, I would say, wrong. A few months ago, I did share some of my concerns about the NBC and the code. Beyond that, I've said nothing. I've literally said nothing. Until obviously, like, you know, I became a target, as I like to think, um, of, of just like, just untruths, right? And I think that that is sort of where my concern is coming from. If you can get the fundamental um, nature of Iroko and how we operate incorrect, then what are you regulating? What are you putting out there? So I guess my perspective remains the same. Um, I think this required a bit more uh, engagement. It required a bit more um, uh, sort of feedback. And more importantly, like in terms of just the legal draft, and I just reiterate, it's just so unclear. It, 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 this, this, if this was written incredibly well and it was well defined, I could understand it, you know, but it's, it's so unclear that it creates more questions than it actually answers in the first place. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me just chip in since I asked the initial question. Um, thanks, Jason, for the response. And I would say, first of all, I mean, you still haven't said exactly when the code affects you and how it negatively affects you. That's one point. The second point is I'll ask you, have you actually read the full NBC code document that's about 160 pages that has all the definitions at page 126? The third point, you, you open up a kind of ones. I mean, you and the NBC DG, there's this sort of back and forth that, you know, sort of, I'll say the genesis was your initial first comments about the code online. And, you know, now you're saying stuff about making money in Nigeria, taking it away and the rest. And I guess I kind of have an idea what the NBC DG is referring to as a content producer probably coming from how you commission and your commissioning sort of practices which going by you said you have off-com licenses in the uk you do business in the uk does not follow general commissioning conventions in the sense that like the nbc dg mentioned content creators the producers are the people that are vested with the primary first ip that are then transferred to broadcasters on a licensing basis but in your own scenario you basically do not share sort of ip with the producers going forward so i guess that might be what triggered his comments in terms of the cutting money away in terms of syndicate. Baba, 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 thank you. Um, I'm going to release Jason, the letter. Jason, just, just Jason, a bit. Let me release Jason, the letter. Can I, can so, come no, back let, to let you. me release the letter. Okay. <laughs> I'll release the letter. It's fine. Okay. Um, so I'll come, I'll go to in, um, NMD now. NMD, please, could you respond to the EPL issues raised by the DG? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I understand the NBC's um, intent and ambition is to create a favorable, um, a 
an, an equal play equal playing ground make it uh, make it available for everybody let nigerian businesses compete um let our local content get some investment let's enjoy some of the benefits of all this but the truth is um there is far more ambiguity than there is clarity right now um there there it's as if there are a, a few more loopholes for people to exploit while the intentions might be good is it the best thing I understand the rationale, but I, I think that we might, uh, well, for want of a better term, be misguided in an attempt to do something good. And, and this is my issue. Yes, some people have the rights for the EPL. They've had it. I remember a period where um, Bond was entitled to a share of it. On NTA, we had some weekend matches, uh, two or three a weekend. It afforded some people some matches. But also, I remember that during that period, the matches that the local stations were showing were... Watford Everton, it wasn't matches people really wanted to watch. One. Two, um, with regards to people advertising on it and saying that they need to advertise one section that got me was six to eleven. To so paraphrase saying that um, if you're broadcasting or uh, sponsoring any local any um, foreign content, you should do the same for local content where available. Such things where available. So it now means that we have to start arguing about definitions of what is in the same category? You know, these categories, is it category by the exact sport, category by the cadre of the sport? You know, there are so many definitions left unanswered that I personally could pick enough loopholes and escape enough things. So even this does not address a major issue of whether or not it will be beneficial to local people. Um, I remember uh, Mr. Ailaron mentioned about um, somebody wanting rights to take to some communities, and let some people have maybe some uh, be the regional content providers in that area. But Jason also raised a very valid point. What is a fair price? I bought the rights as a cost. What I believe is a fair price might not be a fair price in Nigeria to who wants to buy it. It's, it's very nice to um, be very, very utilitarian and want the best for everybody. But at the end of the day, these are businesses. These things are given at auctions. It's not that it's for sale. People auction, they have to bid for it, get the best prizes. It costs a lot, not just for the licenses fee. There are other um, service charges, lawyers, administrators, and all sorts of people involved in the entire value chain of even just acquiring these rights. So when you come to a country, do we have the people here with the purchasing power to acquire these rights at a cost that will be beneficial to the person reselling across the various platforms? whether it's online, whether it's pay TV, whether it's terrestrial TV, do we have them here? Um, do we have an environment that's ready to absorb this? Is there something that has been created? Are there protocols ready? Is there, in, is there investment? Are there soft loans for people who want to go into this? You know, are there special arrangements for anybody interested? Because um, the leader question to this was about COVID-19. So things are not even getting better. People are um, investing less. Fewer MPOs are coming into media houses. Um, we independent producers are having serious issues getting advertisements because people are not spending that much on adverts again. In a business, the first place you want to cut off is spend on adverts. Production is your main thing you need to worry about. So, and that's the major source of funds, advertisements. So the question is, with people reducing money on ad spend, who is going to have the money when your revenue, when you purchase this licensing, it's going to come from adverts, who is going to do it? So as, as much as the NBC is doing all these things, I feel that they are not enough, there's not enough structure behind it to make sure that one, there's capacity to acquire these things at a fair price, that it is sustainable. Uh, we saw high TV come and go. We saw FSTV never start. We've seen this thing kind of thing over and over again. Is this sustainable? Will it last long? You know, is there some sort of um, industry succession plan that as businesses are growing older and ages are changing, technology is changing, there are new entrants that can ease into the market? Because in all honesty, um, the barrier to entry for broadcasting in Nigeria is very high. From licensing to equipment to all the various levies at state level you have to pay. You know, I don't want to derail too much, but one thing I will say that was a positive from this thing was the payment of adverts, um, payment of adverts, payment for adverts rather, because it's a major problem. I mean, you have to wait 90 days after termination before you can pay. And when I talk about barrier to entry now, a lot of media houses, I'm sure you know, sir, are owing salary. There are people who are owing two years straight who will not call their names here. But they are radio and television stations. So now, if we are coming into this environment where advert agencies don't pay till 90 days after termination, 
and if after 90 days they start talking about compliance issues, the back and forth happens, they might not pay you for six, seven, eight months, salaries are being owed, people are having trouble even managing the structure on ground. We have epileptic power supply, the cost of alternative power supply is ridiculous. The fee for maintaining and replacing UPSs and inverters is very high. The cost of diesel to buy to run the generators that power this equipment is very high. Can these same companies now give a favorable price to acquire these licenses from those that are holding it? All right. Thank you, NMD, for your insights. And um, we'll go back to Jason. Jason, could you please respond to Baba's questions? You're, you're about to speak, and then I interjected. Okay, I can you guys hear me? Sorry, my, my network is pretty bad at the moment. Okay, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so I have to turn off my video. Um, sorry, can you say the question again? I was just sorting out my thing. Okay, I was saying, could you want to respond to Baba? Because I cut you off earlier. Oh, okay. No problem. So, um, Baba asked really pertinent questions, right? Have I read the 160-page um, copyright code? I think that was the question. Uh, no, Baba, I haven't. Um, have I fully understood the aspects of the amendment? No, Baba, I haven't. Um, I got my lawyers to. Um, again, the, 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 the law firm I use um, is one of the most respected in Nigeria. Um, we went through it at great length. Um, again, we sent letters to um, the, the, the NBCDG, uh, Professor who's here. Uh, thank, thank, thankfully, he acknowledged that he received the letter, so thank you very much for that. Um, we sent it to the chairman. Um, we also sent it to um, the vice president's office as well. We're following up there as well. Um, again, just to make it more clear, I guess, I'm going to go ahead and release that letter so you guys can see what my specific issues are. I, I'm not here to argue legalese. That can be done by lawyers. Uh, we have fantastic lawyers in Nigeria. I think ultimately the Nigeria um, law system is robust enough to, I guess, clarify any issues. Um, so I guess there are broader issues before you get to the legalese, but I think at first glance, again, I'm going to release the letter you so you can read it there. And if, I'm happy to have that in engagement uh, uh, publicly if you want to. My preference with all things is try not to do them publicly, but if you want to sort of take it that route, then I have no problem doing that as well. Um, but again, I think just, just to sort of like reiterate, um, the, 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 the commercial, um, I would say the largest uh, contributors to um, Nigerian content Nollywood um, were not carried along. The largest people who are actually investing and building an industry were not carried along. So I think for all intents and purposes, like this amendment still impacts them quite significantly. In fact, it probably impacts them um, the most um, aside from um, sports. And with the lack of clarity, again, it makes it very, very difficult for us to fully understand what the repercussions are. And again, when I talk about Iwako being specifically talked about and targeted, there was clear evidence of a video and media conversations a few weeks ago, where again, like, you know, uh, there were some big questions asked Iwako, questions which were 100% um, incorrect. Uh, and again, I'm gonna go on record and say they were 100% incorrect. And again, I'm gonna go on record and say, um, you know, I would hope that professor will take the opportunity to acknowledge that they were incorrect and apologize for that uh, here and in writing as well. Um, so, Baba, again, you know, the, the, the code has got pushed back from the large majority of people. Um, and again, there's been numerous webinars that I've sort of like listened into, um, one as early as uh, Saturday, um, where, again, some really distinguished people genuinely were like, look, this thing, you know, has a lot of ramifications, it's not very clear, it's incredibly um, 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 Sort of difficult to understand and its repercussions, etc. So, if you want to specify making any work of thing, I'm happy to do that. But I'm happy to do that because I've done the work, right? But I'm not going to sort of have this conversation right now. But no problem. I'm about to post it in about five minutes, so we can take it from there. To answer your question, Baba. Thanks. I could look online to see. But why? Why I ask that question is this, right? I, I I've spoken with a bunch of producers, different people across different sides of the argument, and I what I find or it's sort of what I would say is a misunderstanding of the code in the sense that, or misinterpretation of the code. Because if you're, like you said, there's the legal leave side and everybody pushes it to lawyers, right? Which is one thing. You might not understand it without the broadcast background. And if you read it just with the broadcast background, you might not get it. Because going through, I think one of the sides that you had, 
if I'm, I don't know if I'm right, but you had pointed out before where it goes on the wholesale offer. It's referring to channels, not content, and talking about pay TV platforms and entrance into pay TV and them having access to content creators have been dragged into this whole discussion because content creators license to broadcast channels who are broadcasters and then broadcast channels license to broadcast platforms who are broadcasters as well. So maybe it's the confusion of the two broadcasters that are both referred to as broadcasters. But again, that's why I asked you specifically how it affected you or what your issues were because in my view, it works for content creators because the channels are available on more platforms, which means more eyeballs, which means more ad revenues, which means higher licensing fees and just better opportunities in general. But um, I'll check your letter and then I'll respond to the specific points you highlight on what your issues are. But thank you for the. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to uh, try to get Mr. Namdi again because of uh, the industry uh, experience that he was uh, mentioning earlier. Um, the code requires uh, prime foreign spot, spotting content not to be broadcast unless prime local spotting content has all also been acquired by the broadcaster and it, it, it brings in some percentage. Now, uh, for, for the Nigerian market, there seems to be some obscurity as to what the, 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 the amount of getting prime foreign sporting content is. So how, how do you think this would actually play out uh, in reality, uh, given that you have some considerable experience uh, within the sports industry? Yes, Th thank you very much. Um, I've been going on about ambiguity, and this is another area. Um, we know that uh, Super Sports has for Sub-Saharan Africa. We know that Bain has for Middle East and North Africa, but I cannot with any honesty, any honesty tell you that there is a certain figure anybody knows is the cost of EPL rights or any rights for Nigeria alone. First area of ambiguity. So if you're going to use that to even calculate what you should put into foreign local content, you have an issue. So the first issue there is the issue of transparency. Do we have the actual figures? Do we have the actual numbers? That's the first step. When that is sorted, there's also the issue of our premium local content, how much is there? You know, we're having a chat earlier, and I said, if this was when I was a kid with mobile track and field and everything, there is, if you get the IWF Diamond League, you get the mobile track and field, you know? You get the Tour de France, Giro d'Italia, you get the Nigerian cycling tournament. There is so many, there's so, there are so many uh, sporting activities that do not have replicants in Nigeria. The same thing, if you even agree that there's a percentage of what super sports claim is the rights for Nigeria alone. What Nigerian sporting content can request 30% of that? What do we have here? I think with those rights holders, a lot of things are out of their control. One, the NFL and the NPFL run the Nigerian football leagues from the, the sorry, the LMC and the NFL run it from the NPFL, the NNL down. It's not, the, the, it's not within the uh, purview of the rights holder. All they can do is come and buy TV rights for it. The same thing with advertisers. If the leagues are not holding, the leagues are always abridged. We always have tussles in our sporting federations. The AFF has two rival factions. The MBBF has two rival factions. You know, we had the Giwa and Phoenix faction for a long time. All these things are out of the control of the rights holder for foreign sporting content. So now, what do they do in this situation? So this is what I meant by ambiguity. There are so many things that are not covered. If you're demanding that they purchase premium local content, then our local content has to be available. And in all honesty, not enough of it is available. If we were to put local content, even Nigerians' um, friendly matches played in London, rights held by foreign, a lot of the production team. If I look at what comprises local content, the production team are they Nigerian? The actors in it are they Nigerian? The only thing Nigerian about most of our friendly matches is the super events and their coaching staff. The stadium, the venue, the production crew, even a lot of the fans in those stadia are not Nigerian. So it can't even be classified as local content. So how much local content is really available? This is how limited it is. 
NPFL World Cup and Nations Cup qualifiers in Nigeria for football. For track and field, it's the sports festival has been on hold for what four or five years. Hasn't been four or five editions have been skipped. They haven't been able to hold it. So what is the prime track and field content? Is it Nuga? The closest we have to anything concerning tertiary sports that is well organized is the higher institution football league, which is run by a private company. And in all fairness to a brand like Super Sports, they are the media backbone of that. You know? So, so there's, again, I come back to this ambiguity. We don't have enough content, you know, which is out of the control of the rights holder, out of the control of the advertisers. Because first of all, the federations, which are autonomous, we've seen what happens when sometimes government tries to directly interfere with federations. You interfere with the AFN, I, IAAF will step in. You interfere with the NFL, FIFA will step in. So even the government has a limit to what it can do. So if a lot of these things are out of control of the right holders and the advertisers, how can we now bring certain um, parts of the code and insist on certain things that are not honestly feasible in the immediate future? All right. All right. I, 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 I hear you talking about no good local content and, and all that, and no, a lot enough. of I'm um, I, I, I think. Not I enough, think, not no good, not enough. Not enough, okay. Not enough. Okay, great. Now, now so I, I think what, when you talk about the ambiguity, the, reg, the regulator would have uh, some thoughts about that. I mean, because I, I want to believe that they would also have this at the back of their mind, but I, I, would, I would let Professor uh, respond, but I want to just add this so that Professor can take both together. You know, it's, it's a major cause of concern uh, that uh, when, when you try to acquire rights for broadcast of events, or let's say in this case now, live sporting events available to uh, other broadcasters through different channels, you, you want commercially agreeable rates. In an event where parties are unable to, you know, agree, somebody holds, everybody holds his own end of the stick. How does MBA resolve issues like that? And, and then, what would you consider to be the parameters, you know, for determining the, the, the price that these things will go for? Let's, let's have your uh, thoughts on that, and you can then take some of those ambiguities and just roll it into a ball. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, let me... Let me commend Namdi for his depth of knowledge about the broadcast industry. Uh, apparently, we're um, quite knowledgeable and I'm uh, impressed. Uh, but let me also um, join your last question with what Namdi, or the point Namdi has been trying to make all the while with regarding uh, what he calls ambiguity. Uh, I like the point when he noted that a major problem with the, with the industry generally is lack of existing sustainable structure, right? And because those structures are not there, for instance, uh, verifiable data, uh, means of financing, uh, and, 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 and once some of those foundations, critical foundations are not there, of course, uh, we are likely to find uh, what uh, number refers to as some of this existing ambiguity. But I think the base of it all uh, is, 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 is all intent and pose, is lack of transparency, uh, which uh, in itself is not just uh, a broadcast industry mandate, it's, uh, it's something that has existed in several subsectors of the economy. Uh, number mentioned, for instance, the collapse of uh, FSTV, uh, the collapse of uh, high TV and several other pay TV uh, platforms that attempted to come into the broadcasting landscape. Uh, some of the reasons why they didn't survive, basically, uh, principally uh, due to monopolistic tendency, uh, big, big people who wanted to elbow new entrants, uh, but also additionally, uh, you will also find out that, that um, in terms of negotiations at certain times, um, people didn't come straight and clean. I, um, I, I recall that even at the time, um, multi-choice 
even when they had exclusive right to the EPL, there was a time they agreed to sub-license in this country. And I recall that they did sub-license to a few uh, TV platforms. Uh, but I also remember that at a certain time, it became very difficult for them to come to an agreement with some of the broadcasters that they were supposed to sub-license to. I recall that the MD of High TV, Mr. Toye Subai at the time, was also willing to make some of the EPL matches that he acquired uh, available to some uh, broadcasters. Again, it was a heated engagement, and at a certain point, due to lack of transparency and consensus, they couldn't agree at uh, what we have referred to as fair and equitable price. Uh, but what the law basically says, uh, the broadcasting group, is that where there is a disagreement between operators, uh, the NBC will arbitrate. Now, but we also know that arbitration in itself uh, sometimes is not final. Uh, and I've seen somewhere in the Copyright Act where, in their own wisdom, they did also say that where agreements are not reached, uh, there is a possibility that the courts will decide. Our earnest expectation is that Nigerian broadcasters and operators will come to the level that they can build transparent integrity in business to the extent that people can give and take in a peaceful and mutually agreed basis. And, um, and I think that that, 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 that basically is, uh, is, is the way forward, as we have seen in many other economies. Uh, we hope that we will mature to the level that there will be trust. Uh, and uh, if that is established and there is transparency, of course, there will be no need for litigation or arbitration. And that underscores the point that we've been trying to make as NBC, that we have no intention in any way to fix prices. We know that broadcasting operates as a liberal economy like other economies. And we know that uh, the, 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 the catch word for transaction is mutuality of, of, of interest. So we expect that even our own broadcasters will come to the level that government or any arbitrator will not be involved in the transaction. However, there appears to be credibility and transparency gap, a huge deficit. And I hope uh, operators uh, will get to that level that we can put that behind us. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, all over the place, uh, transparency issues are something that uh, is a cause of concern uh, to everybody, the stakeholders, the regulators, and we, we, we hear you. I, I think I would uh, want to have enough uh, take up the next uh, thing. Thank you, Ayokunle. So we'll go over to the Q&A session now. Um, the first question is directed to Professor Ida Chaba. So there's a question on so it says one of the provisions of the code deals with prime local sports content to be acquired for at least 30% of prime foreign sports content. How does the NBC intend to get rights holders or foreign league to pay at least 30% for the NPFL? Okay, brilliant. I'm glad also this came up. You see, as part of the consensus building and interest building in the process of producing the code, we actually get papers, position papers, contributions from. Are you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear okay. you. So we get we get contributions, position papers from stakeholder interest groups uh, in the broadcast sector. Some of the provisions, most of the provisions we have made uh, regarding sporting rights, it may interest you to know we have come from the sporting groups themselves. Uh, principally the Nigerian Football Association and many other uh, sports loving interest groups that have clamored for some kind of local investment in the, sub, in, the in the sporting sector. Now, the argument basically is that uh, a lot of people, uh, advertisers, invest so much in investing in foreign sports to the detriment of local sports. And we are saying if you are going to invest so so amount of money, huge sums of money in acquiring foreign sporting rights, you must be willing to contribute at least as you have read 30% of some of those uh, provisions in also building our own local sport industry. Now, Undam did mention uh, the, the, the matter about a certain degree of ambiguity in that area. 
Of course, I agree. Maybe in future we we'll need to come up with more exactitude uh, regarding uh, some of those uh, definitions. But uh, a basic example will suffice to say, for instance, uh, in, we have a lot of traditional sports in Nigeria, right? There is the, sport, there is the horse racing, uh, what we call the doba. Uh, there is the boot regatta. Uh, there are a lot of traditional sports across the country. And some of these things can be raised to a competitive level that they can also enjoy international patronage. Now, but these this sporting events cannot have uh, local or international visibility if there's no direct investment. So this policy actually aims at getting people who are investing in foreign content, sporting content, to also do the same as a way of building up, um, of building up the, the local sporting industry. And like I mentioned, there are lots of them. Uh, before you know, if you invest, you pick on one, you patronize, uh, you, you, may, you may brand it up to a level that it can also become a, a major premium content. That's what we think. And that should be the essence of, of regulatory interventions anyway. Thank you, sir. So the next question is for Mr. Aila. Mr. Aila, does the, does the, the question is, does the Copyright Act provide for a blanket compulsory licensing of all copyright works? The fourth schedule relates to compulsory licenses for translation and reproduction of certain works that is literary or dramatic work for teaching, research, or scholarship. Does preventing exclusivity for sports or some other content for entertainment on pay TV actually amount to this? Hi, sir, please, could you unmute? Uh We can't hear you, Mr. Ilara. Hello, how now? I think we can. We can go on now. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the Copyright Act did not provide for compulsory licensing in a blanket sense like that. But if a particular author or right owner is denying the licensing of his works, for other users, then the compulsory licensing thing will come in. So it is not on a global scale like that. It is on, I think, a work by work basis or a right by right basis. If you have made it available to A, then you should be able to make it available to me at this, on the same terms and conditions upon which you have made it available to the others. And I think this exclusivity thing is also there in many nations of the world. For example, in the US, many of the rights we are talking about here are not exclusive. They are issued on the basis of non-exclusivity. And I think that is the same thing we have in the European laws. And the essence of this is to make it available to anyone who is really interested, and it also means more money to the right owner, because the more people you have exploit, exploiting your work or exploiting your rights, the more income you are likely to get. So that is the way I think it is. Uh, the other part of your question, I don't know if that covers that because of time, you know? Yes, sir, that's fine, sir. Okay. Thank you. I, I think this, this question is for uh, Unamdi. Uh, and uh, one of our participants had asked that should the MBC be involved in determination of pricing? Uh, would that make MBC actually a participant or a regulator in that process? What, what do you think? It's a, it's, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very tricky question. And I think the person who acts is, is, is making a bit of a very valid point. The truth is the MBC is a broadcast regulator. Um, if you're regulating the type of content, quality of content, amount of a type of content, 
that is broadcasted here. Yes. Um, when it comes to commercial, I can't really speak, but I, I would say that um, for things like Fair Play, who handles um, commercial regulation? We have um, Apex banks, regulatory bodies for things financial, things commerce, trade and industry. We have such bodies. Um, if the NBC is looking at a thing of oversight with respect to how foreign broadcasters are treated, yes. But I, I, I think um, to an extent, I might have to agree with the um, ask, person who asked the question that perhaps the NBC should not be directly involved. Oversight, yes. You know, I, I think the NBC might be able to explain to us better. Again, ambiguity. I'm not sure to what level the NBC is involved in the pricing. You know, I cannot say they did not meet stakeholders who said this is what should be priced at the end of the day. So that is where it comes in. So I think, honestly, the NBC will be in a better position to say which stakeholders were consulted before an agreement was made on what kind of pricing structure there should be. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Nandi. Um, I think we've had a very fruitful discussion today. There are questions uh, that are still popping in that we have not been able to take during this time. We'll get some of those questions. Uh, we'll get those questions to our panelists, get their responses to uh, those who've asked those questions so that they can clarify. At this point, I want to call on the partner in charge of the sports practice in the firm, Mr. Mark Modi, to give a vote of thanks to our panelists and the participants on this webinar. Mr. Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was fascinated by some of the arguments that were presented during the course of the webinar. They were, they were fascinating arguments, animated, and, and you know, all the participants, uh, the DG, um, Namdi, uh, Baba, um, Mr. Ayala, Jason, all of you brought to the table your wealth of, of knowledge and expertise. You know, you brought it to bear on this topic and, and I cannot help but say, gentlemen, very well done. Uh, you guys did a fantastic job. So please keep on, I mean, expect questions. And, and I suspect, and I'm sure Sumba, my partner, will agree with me that, you know, this topic is worth revisiting in the future. So uh, having said that, I just want to say thank you to everybody who participated, those uh, good number of you that left your afternoon to come and share with us. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you for joining in on the call and uh, the webinar. I hope it was a blessing to all of you. Um, God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, I have the privilege of declaring the webinar closed. Thank you and see you soon. Hopefully we'll have part two of this topic. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Ijachoba. Thank you, Namdi. Jason, yeah. thank you. Mr. Yilan, thank you. And Baba, thank you. Thank, thank you, Ina, and thank you, Adetula. Uh, thank, thank you. Too. Bye. Bye. Bye.